As the summer campaigning season in Northern Virginia heated up, and John Pope arrived on the scene taking command of the Army of Virginia, he faced off against Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson. The Army of Virginia was augmented by units from the Army of the Potomac, which had recently fought on the James River Peninsula. Among the units transferred was the 5th Corps under the command of Fitz John Porter. It was Porter's fate that he served under Pope and became the scapegoat for Pope's failures in the lead up to the Battle of Second Bull Run. Fitzjohn Porter was a career military man in the U.S. Army. He had graduated in the top of his class from West Point in 1845 and initially served in the force U.S. Artillery. Considering the age nature of the U.S. military command at the time, advancement was slow and ambitious officers had to be creative in seeking assignments to advance their careers. In Porter's case, that meant accepting an adjutant general position. After different opportunities, Porter received a division command in the reorganized Army of the Potomac under James B. McClellan, with whom he developed a close professional relationship, a fateful friendship that eventually furthered Porter's demise. As the Army of the Potomac was in the process of withdrawing from the peninsula, after the unsuccessful Seven Days Battles, Porter and his Fifth Corps were reassigned to the Army of Virginia. He was not happy with the reassignment. Unfortunately and carelessly, he voiced his opinion in a number of letters that he sought were private. In a scribble to Manton Marble, the editor of The World on August 10, he called his new superior, John Pope, a fool. An Arvin McDowell, one of Pope's corps commanders, a rascal. He also complained to General Ambrose Burnside, not knowing that the side Bernadette General was sending them unedited to the political leadership in Washington. Worst, he vented to Census Chief Joseph Kennedy, assuming they shared misgivings about Pope. He observed, I regret to see the General Pope has not improved since his use, and has now written himself down what the military world has long known, an ass. The assessment came to President Lincoln, Secretary of State William H. Seward, and eventually even John Pope's attention. Despite his personal misgivings about Pope, Porter quickly set his corps in motion to assist his new commander. Pope, aware of what Porter had said about him in the letter to Kennedy, wondered, however, if Porter would fail him, setting up a struggle that we'll discuss in the next video. On August 27, 1862, Porter arrived at Pope's headquarters 
in the telegraph office at Warrington Junction. The two men started off on a bad foot. Not surprising, Pope knew of Porter's opinion of him. Concerningly, Porter quickly realized, and correctly assumed, that Pope had no plan for the foreseeable battle to come. That evening, Porter received orders from Pope to put his corps in motion at 1 a.m. and reach Bristow Station by daylight. Accounts on Porter's reaction vary from him indicating that he intended to disobey or that he was just using an ironic tone of voice. Porter's division commanders did object as their man had marched a long distance already. Clogged roads and darkness prevented a night march. As a result, Porter ordered his general to start at 3 a.m. As Porter's corps advanced along the railroad, McDowell's corps was moving on Warrenton Turnpike. Pope hoped to catch the elusive Jackson, who had taken shelter in the woods north of Groveton, just about in the path of McDowell's force headed to Centerville. Meanwhile, James Longstreet's troops were in a position to threaten the U.S. left and rear. As McDowell found out of Longstreet's arrival, he unsuccessfully tried to communicate so to Pope. Pope was going back and forth between promising McDowell troops to crush Longstreet and worrying about Jackson's location. After three contradictory orders from Pope in one hour, McDowell decided to consult with the commander in person at Manassas Junction. Pope had, however, relocated to Centerville by that point. Before he could set off in that direction, McDowell heard gunfire. His troops had engaged Longstreet at Thoroughfare Gap and Jackson above Groveton. Jackson had engaged Brigadier General John Gibbons' brigade of King's Division as it made its way up to Warrington Turnpike. When Pope heard of the engagement, he ordered Porter to abandon Bristol and make his way towards Centerville. Pope incorrectly assumed that he could place Jackson between the two wings of his army and crush the enemy in the middle. The only one to correct the error was McDowell, who was nowhere to be found. As elements of the Army of Virginia Converge on the old battlefield of the year before. Pope's orders reached Porter sometime in the morning on August 29. Captain Strother, Pope's aide, delivered the order, but he did not recall properly when exactly he did so. As day broke on August 29, McDowell was still absent, so Gibbon, who had engaged Jackson, went directly to Pope to inform him of the situation. Pope finally knew that he didn't have Jackson surrounded. As a result, he altered Porter's order to turn in advance on the road to Gainesville and thus regain Jackson's rear. At 7 a.m., Porter's 2nd Division under Brigadier General George Sykes set off as ordered initially to Centerville. Porter, of course, could hear gunfire to the northwest and wondered why he was marching away from the battle. As Porter's troops marched through Manassas Junction, they encountered the lost McDowell, who informed Potter of the lack of troops to Jackson's west, making Pope's order even more odd. Around 9 a.m., Porter's lead elements encountered Captain Piet of Pope's staff with the new battle orders for McDowell. He orally told Porter of Pope's new plans and handed the written copy to McDowell. Porter immediately adjusted the direction of his forces. The new advance was delayed by almost an hour when the troops ran into the ammunition train and replenished their supplies. During this time, Gibbon arrived with the written orders for Porter's new advance. While Porter asked McDowell for information about the terrain ahead, McDowell was fuming. Pope had assigned Brigadier General Rufus King's division to Porter. 
McDowell immediately requested that Pope change that part of the order. Near Bethlehem Church, Porter's men briefly encountered enemy scouts, but they withdrew quickly. Meanwhile, Jeb Stewart's cavalry shadowed Porter's advance, and by riding back and forth on the Gainesville Road, created the impression of enemy reinforcements headed in Porter's direction. Leading the way, Charles Griffith's brigade threw some skirmishers in front of the advance when they encountered a cavalryman who informed them that his companion had been captured by rebels. When the skirmishers reached Dawkins Branch, a dry stream that posed no obstacle to infantry, rebel horsemen fired on the skirmishers, halting the entire column. Porter was too late to get behind Jackson, and Longstreet had arrived. Without cavalry, Porter had only a limited ability to scout the area and figure out the disposition of the enemy. Finally, in the early afternoon, new orders arrived from Pope, but they left McDowell and Porter confused. When McDowell came riding up, chastising Porter that this was not the place for a battle, Porter, junior in rank, assumed he was ordered to stop the advance. Then, both generals rode off into the woods to see if they could reach the forces on the turnpike. When Porter suggested that McDowell take a division around the war, the general galloped off without instructions to Porter, leaving Porter standing. As a result, Porter set up a position on the ridge southeast of Dawkins Branch, trying to close the gap with the troops north and await orders. Pope's orders and McDowell's actions had stopped any attack by Porter's corps. Porter didn't yet know that McDowell had requested the return of King's Division. The man, still camped around Bethlehem Church, soon received order to move with McDowell up the Sudley Road. When Porter heard, he took it as confirmation that McDowell had adopted his suggestion and that he would now have to wait for King and McDowell to appear on his right. As he waited for King and McDowell's arrival, Porter tried to scout the enemy position in front of him. The skirmishers encountered a few enemy horsemen, who fired a few shots and then retreated. They could eventually hear infantry commands ahead, but no assault. Meanwhile, around Warrenton Turnpike, the two sides exchanged skirmishing fire and artillery shells. McDowell had kept most of King's division on the Sudley Road near Henry Hill and not ordered them to connect with Porter. Porter made two inquiries with McDowell about his disposition and orders, but McDowell never responded, and neither did he forward them to Pope, leaving both his superior and Porter in the dark. Porter worried increasingly that his troops were cut off and his couriers not getting through. He contemplated having to withdraw, as suggested in Pope's earlier orders. His men were also running low on food and water. Porter moved his headquarters from Dawkins Branch to Bethlehem Church to shorten communications with McDowell but still, no answer arrived. His concern of getting cut off increased when his skirmishers reported additional forces and maneuvering to his flanks. Despite suggestions to withdraw, Porter determined to hold the line, at least for the moment, and inform McDowell about his plan to withdraw, and thus gives the army time to adjust. He did order a small unit, temporarily attached to his command to withdraw to Manassas Junction. Unfortunately for Porter, Pope still had no grasp of the enemy position, and the withdrawal of the small unit attached to Porter's command gave Pope the wrong impression of what Porter was doing. At 4.30 p.m., Pope gave the order for Porter to attack the enemy. Once crafted, the order went out with Captain Douglas Pope around 5 p.m. 
Porter's note that he would have to withdraw to Manassas finally reached Pope's headquarters. But Pope didn't seem to understand the message. With an hour of daylight remaining, Porter heard from one of his couriers that the enemy was in retreat, and he ordered two regiments to test that notion. The order was timestamp 5:45. When it reached the front, it was too late to advance, and the officers in command of the skirmishers observed that no withdrawal was taking place. When Pope's order arrived, about two hours after its drafting, because the younger Pope had lost his way in the growing darkness, Porter sent it to the front. But his commanders again reiterated that it was too late in the day. As a result, Porter called off the attack on his own authority. A fateful decision for Porter's career. When the young Pope returned to his uncle's headquarter, informing him that Porter would not attack, Pope started talking of arresting Porter. However, Pope already knew since 5 p.m. that Porter had intended to withdraw. At 8:50 p.m., Pope ordered Porter to bring his troops to the Warrenton Turnpike and assist in the fight there. It would take. Six hours for the order to reach Porter, who had not withdrawn as Pope sought to Manassas Junction, but dug in Dawkins Branch. At this point, Porter finally realized that Pope was in charge, and not MacDowell. In the end, Pope and Porter shared one thing in common: they were both mistaken about the tactical situation in the lead up. To the Second Battle of Bull Run, the troop movements on August 29, and the many misconceptions that day, had a dramatic impact on Porter's career and his court martial. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.